Hello in, in England, and we're just going to have a little chat about these these vases. The, the, the thing here is that they're all Jap they're all Japanese, but they look completely different. They have a different feel. And what happened in Japan was they were banging out their own stuff hundreds of years, some of which looks Chinese. And then in the 19th century, the external influence came, and they started to make foreign style Japanese pottery. And if you look at what they're wearing in Japan, there's a, there's a date in the 19th century where they start to wear suits, European suits, the lounge suits. The lounge suits are what all the politicians wear everywhere and they're based on tunics. Uh, a lounge suit is a, is, a, is a tunic, like the ones they wore in Zulu, with the lapels folded down. That's what a suit is. That's what a lounge suit is. It's a military, derived from military, custom, uh, customary costume and in Japan, as I say, the day comes when they abandon their traditional wear, the leaders, and sometimes they wear the European costume and they adopt and borrow European customs when it comes to industry, train, steam, etc, etc. And the culmination of that was the Empire of Japan, which was a mechanised empire with warships. So the same thing happened with pottery. This is a traditional Japanese pot, balusta. This is something, these handles you see on lots of Japanese pots. The, this one has a footed bottom, which is just an extra dimension. You can, you can stop a pot down here, just have it plain at the bottom, but they put a foot on it. You have the ge geometrical pat pattern, geometrical patterns, and a very busy fussy, fussy pot, and the Japanese like that. This has lost a bit of the, the clay, a bit of the porcelain, quite easy to fix because it's located independently. You have a side to copy or take a cast from. You can attach it and colour it quite easy because it is gold. So on this one you have beautiful scenes all the way around. It's not even a case of having two sides. It's got, it has got two sides, but I mean there's not really a blank side. Beautifully done. Really can't get across, can't get across to you how well done it is. And I put that at 18, 80, 80, 90. There are many of them like this which are. Not so nicely done running into the 20th century. You get the stoneware ones like this well into the 20th century, but as I say, I think that one is a good one. Just notice there's some detail inside the top. So it's a great shame it's damaged, but I think that because it's of a certain size and quality, I think you can forgive it. So <clears throat> I talked about the styles in Japan diverging from cultural, traditional to outside world designs, and these are Japanese, but they don't look Japanese, they look French, but they are Japanese. So what they're doing in Japan is they realize that the Export market wants different types of pottery and domestic in Japan to be sophisticated, they want to have foreign looking pottery to be up to date. So these would have been made for the home market and the export market. These are not made by hand. I'll explain to you how in a minute. This one here is potted on a wheel, traditionally. It's not made by slip. There is a flange on the inside of this neck. You can see it here. This has been added when the clay was wet. You can't get your hand down there, so it was not potted in one go. The top section has finger marks running up the neck, meaning it was done on a wheel. You can have those put in to fake pots, so be careful, you can't only rely on looking for those, but it is a good sign. So that one made traditionally, decorated traditionally. These are not, these are made by slip. So what they did here, is they, lose, they use liquefied pottery. So what you do is you use a slurry, you take the pottery in the clay, you churn it and mill it till it's fine with no lumps in it, and you pour it into a mould. So the mould in this case would have been plaster, two halves, like a clam, would have come together, and the mould would have had a hole in the top, would have been strapped together or screwed together, and they would have um, poured the slurry into the mould. The mould is hollow, there's nothing in the middle to provide the mould shape for the inside. Gravity does it, I'll explain how. So you have the mould, it's plaster, it's heavy, bone dry. The slurry is poured into the top, like milk or porridge, just poured in, custard consistency, and then they have to swill it. So they will have a jig where the machine does it for them, or they will do it by hand, or they will do it on a basic machine, and they will pour out the excess and they have to get enough slip in here to coat the inside of the mould. It's too thick, it's too heavy, 
if it's and they're wasting clay, it's too thin, it will break and you'll be able to push your finger through like you can push your finger through an Easter egg. So they have to get the, the thickness right. It's a really, really skillful job and it's all about timing. It's about temperature, it's about room temperature, atmosphere, how wet the, the slip is. So in here they would have poured in half a litre of slip, maybe a litre of slip, and they would have swirled it round, poured the excess out if there was any. They would have taken it out of the the plaster mould, the two halves. They would have run a blade down it to cut off any excess. They would have put it on a turntable. They would have cut the rim. They would have perhaps used a cloth or sponge to regu regularise the surface. They would have hidden the seam, which you, you can't see. So obviously they would have added the handles as well. These are made in a, these are, these are pressed. They would have been put in a mould, pressed out, and then they would have been stuck on afterwards. The only, I imagine that the most difficult part here was making the, the rim, and I don't know how they've done the rim. Um, I think it's possible the rim was made in a press or it could have been put on and done by hand. I'm not sure how they would have done it. It's very difficult to say. But if we just compare, if we compare the dimensions to see if we have any clues. Well, the waves are different sizes, and I think they've been done by hand. It's quite hard to, to, to make that in a, in, a, in a press, so it's possible. So that would have gone on as a separate piece of augmentation, decoration, and then it would have been wiped on to make it make the joints invisible. The plaster cast um, was plain on the inside. This here is all painted by hand. So you have a pot partially made by machine or device, partially mechanised, finished by hand. Looks French, does not look Japanese. It looks like it's out of Paris. It looks Belle Epoque. Um, I think that that pottery is 1930-40. That's my feeling. There is a mark on it. It says Japan. I can't read it. Um, but it's a transfer mark. It's not a signature, not hand painted. It's not an impression. It's not a sticker. But we have two Japanese um, vases and if you look at Noritake, which is a, the, probably the most prominent porcelain maker in Japan then and now, a lot, a lot of the, the Noritake looks Japanese. They're copying Wedgwood, they're copying Limoges. There is of course some Japanese in it, but it's not Japanese in my view, Noritake, not much of it. So you have these different types of manufacture, different styles, and they're for different people, for different uses. I think because there's two of these, they're not damaged, they're lovely. This is very intricately done, and I believe that is all done by hand. I don't think there's any transfer here at all. Whether they had a stencil or a guide to, make, to help them make it, I don't know. If it comes to cut glass, they will have a guide to make the cut glass. They'll put on marks on the glass so they know how to, to grind it off. They might have put on guides to help them do this. And these will be made in a painting shop by a, by a female, I imagine, or females, and they would have been skilled and they would have just laboriously done it, but done the work, done hundreds, thousands, and um, they would have a knack and get, and get these things made fast. Um, so I hope that's been interesting. These are slip made. This is not slip made. This is potted in two sections. And it, this is really the, the, the basis of understanding the pottery market. I'll just show you a dragon roll here. This is a Far Eastern modern pottery dog of foo or dog of foe. And uh, you can see here, it's been cast like a Staffordshire figure or a teapot. There's no inner mould that could have been withdrawn. So they are lying on the plaster mould. As a, again, it's slip. This is a biscuity slip. This is a porcelain slip. Um, these are slightly, very slightly translucent. So this is much more basic. This is like a Tang era copy. And the, the Tang horses you see are meant to be basic pottery with these lovely running glazes. So you have a dog of food, dog of foe, it's pierced, beautifully made. Not much money because of copy, but you can see this slip casting method, which is dominant when it comes to ceramics now. 90, 95% of pottery in the shops is made using liquefied clay. Um, round things can be spun. For example, a plate, if you make a plate, it rotates. A stationary blade can cut off the excess because it's round. It can be regulated and literally churned out. I've seen the machines that make them. I have seen a machine making making 
The plates are just the size of a three bedroom house. The clay goes on the top on a conveyor belt. It's milled, the, the machine presses these plates. They spin, they go along another turntable. They have an autom automated mark. And I noticed in, in the local supermarket in England, now you can buy a 10 piece set of crockery for 10 pounds, meaning each piece cost a pound. So you can see the, the industrialization and mechanization of pottery has you know really kicked in now. Thanks very much for having a look. Bye.